Hello and welcome to this Carbon Lehigh Intermediate Unit 21 online learning session in our active learning series. Today, we're going to take a look at problem based learning. My name is Eric Leck and I'm the Director of Curriculum and Instruction and Educational Technologies at Carbon Lehigh Intermediate Unit. As you're going through this session, if you're liking what you hear, or if you've been through some of our sessions before and you've enjoyed the content, don't forget to go below this video and click that like or subscribe button so that you can receive updates on any of the content we are releasing now or in the future as part of future series. So let's dive into problem-based learning. First, let's tackle the big question. What is problem-based learning? Maybe you've heard that acronym PBL before, but you've associated it with project-based learning. This is just a little bit different and gives us a different perspective on how we can activate our students as they are learning a new concept or new idea. Problem-based learning is a teaching method in which complex real-world problems are used as the vehicle to promote student learning of concepts and principles as opposed to direct presentation of facts and concepts. This really allows students to dive in to a specific problem and use the context of that problem to better understand new materials and how it applies to the work that they are doing. Problem-based learning can be used in multiple subject areas with multiple different topics. We know that it is a very student-centered and inquiry-based model. Learners will be engaged, and it'll require research, it'll require further depth of understanding than maybe they have previously had. Why might we want to engage in problem-based learning? Well, problems have authenticity. By putting students in situations where they must work through a complex problem, it puts a new stake on the learning environment. It makes that learning more realistic and more applicable for students. It allows students to connect what they are doing to prior knowledge so that they are not only focused on the concept at hand, but how it is intertwined with other concepts that they may have learned before. It gives you an opportunity to hook new learning onto any previous experience or understanding. So students can be using some recall method to do that. It provides application of knowledge. So students are not only uh, understanding, memorizing, and retrieving, but they're actually going to be able to use that knowledge to provide solutions to the possible problem. Students will be very active in their inquiry and questioning throughout a problem-based learning activity. You'll see them asking questions, making sure that they dive in deeper, and using each other to help answer those questions. Finally, you might find that learning and regrouping is going to come from mistakes the students make. So using those mistakes will help inspire and further what they are learning. Added reasons to include problem-based learning as a solution in your classroom are the career-ready benefits. We know that employers want employees that can collaborate and work closely and collaboratively with each other to solve problems and create new products or services. Very often in tours of businesses, and in speaking with employers, we learned that a key principle that makes a good employee, no matter what level or what field, is that employee is able to work well with others. Problem-based learning really encourages that for students. For our students that are college-bound, we know that colleges are seeking learners that inquire to seek deeper understanding, that are willing to take the next step and dig deeper into their learning, and look for students that are really active in their learning process. Problem-based learning is gonna really push that active learning process. So key benefits of problem-based learning for students. First, we know um, that problem-based learning really helps students get more engaged in the learning process because of the relevance, the application, and even the long-term benefits of what's going on as they're learning in a problem-based learning environment they're going to uh, show more engagement and more motivation to solve that problem, especially the more authentic and realistic that task is, what that problem is, the more stakes there will be on solving that problem. 
we also know that it's going to help them develop some lifelong learning skills that will go well beyond just the content of the class classroom. There's going to be a greater emphasis on meaning and how the what they're learning applies to the problem, rather than just memorizing or understanding what's being presented to them. They're going to be developing inquiry skills and figuring out what the next question to ask is to help them really solve the problem at hand. They're going to be using collaboration and negotiation skills as they work with partners or in collaboration with a group. Often problem-based learning requires a great deal of research for students. Whether that research is surface level research or really in-depth research, it's going to ask students to think critically about the sources they're using for information. And of course, tied into that research is that critical thinking component, making sure that they're understanding the material and research that they are doing how it applies, and if it is a valid and solid source of information to be using to solve a problem. Now, as you start to think about using problem-based learning, there's some considerations you should probably make. First is the role of you as the teacher. Problem-based learning activity or unit might ask you as the teacher to step back a little bit further from that direct instructional role. So you're going to have to think about the questioning te techniques you're going to be using so that students can dive deeper into learning. As you check in on groups and see what they're doing, you're really going to want to have prepared some great questions to help them think more deeply without giving them answers to their questions or solving the problem for them. As a teacher, it's going to be really important that you be very patient as students work through the problems. You might find that they are working more slowly or getting more, um, getting to that solution a little bit more slowly than you would like. However, if their progress is continuing and the question is continuing, let that continue. Make sure that they are following that questioning line to get to the end. You might also find that students aren't gonna find a, a solid or viable solution, but we have to let them have that moment of failure so that they can learn from it and see why they maybe didn't get to the right answer easily. Setting expectations is going to be really important for problem-based learning. You'll see later on, I'm going to present some tools and resources that might help scaffold what, um, what students need to better engage in problem-based learning. So it might be important to set some of those expectations and help grow the skills that students need before investing fully in a problem-based learning uh, experience. And finally, Make sure that you're thinking about how you might manage group dynamics. Often, um, as students are working in problem-based learning environments, they are going to run into conflicts with their peers and, and how they're trying to solve problems. So it's going to be important that you're there to help them work through some of that group dynamic and show them how to be more cooperative as they are working in that environment. <clears throat> Ways to help with that might be to consider establishing student roles especially for our younger, younger or middle level learners, having that established role will really help them define what their next steps are and, and what they need to do to help their group be successful. As students get older, you can provide the roles and allow them to select the roles that most suit what they can contribute to the work. Also, helping students understand their responsibility to group success. Oftentimes we hear that in group projects, certain students might dominate or um, certain, certain students may sit back and allow others to take on the work and reap the benefits or the rewards of that, that group's work. However, it's gonna be really important that we reinforce the students and help teach them that the work that they do and the way that they engage is, is a direct um, result of how the final product will come out and that they are very responsible to that group success. We also need to understand that there's going to be different personality types and it's going to be helpful to show students and model for them that being in a group where personality types might clash a little bit is not necessarily going to be a deal breaker or something that leads to a problem not being able to be solved. However, they're going to need to overcome some of those things in order to move forward and solve those problems. When you're thinking about your classroom, this can have many different looks. However, it may look a little bit messy. It may look very hands-on. It may look a little bit or sound a little bit louder in your classroom as students are working through problem-based learning, but it's gonna be very important that they do have that opportunity 
to be interactive, to speak up as they need to speak up and move around as they need to move around to really complete and solve the task at hand. You can see from these images, all different images based on pro problem-based learning, uh, we can see it across multiple classrooms and across different age levels. And it can be a very, very wide variety of things that you'll see and experience going on in your classroom. So now that you have some background and idea of what problem-based learning is, let's talk about some of the phases of problem-based learning so you can better implement this in the classroom. So before I get into any official phases, we really need to think about the preparation. As we work through these phases today, I'm going to use an example from my own experience as a former classroom teacher, as a Spanish teacher. However, please note that as I'm working through some of these examples, it can certainly be applied throughout many different grade levels and scaled to the level that is necessary for your course. So as you see here, the first thing you need to do and think about as a teacher is your preparation phase. Jumping into problem-based learning isn't just about jumping in but you also have to be uh, thinking ahead about how it's related and how it fits in the context of what you are trying to teach. As a former secondary teacher myself, I know it's really important that we are still working to cover content while we are um, imparting new skills in students. So for me, a big part of that preparation phase is choosing a big idea, concept, or essential question that's related to your current unit of study. Remember, your PDE SAS website is a great place to go to relate your standards back to those big ideas, concepts, or essential questions. For me, one that I was immediately thinking about and one where I've used problem-based learning before was around the essential question, which is a um, stage three in world languages, which is a little bit higher level, level two or level three, depending on, on how it's being taught in your school situation. Um, one of the big questions is how can we use a second language we know to exchange information from one person to another? Okay, so there's a lot that can be encompassed in that, but it, it really um, allows us to think about that communicative aspect of language and really a great place to dive into some real world problems and situations that students might encounter that they're gonna have to be able to get their way through and navigate through. The second piece is to consider the context or background knowledge of your students. Whenever you're about to, kind of, to set up a problem for students, it's going to be important that they're able to connect it and find it applicable to their lives and have some relevance around it. So they, you want to ask yourself the question, how is this going to apply to them? So that communication aspect can be really important if they're thinking about their peers. So, you know, this is a situation where my problem that I want to um, impart to my students is definitely going to be peer related so they can think how it really affects and applies to them in their life. Next, you have to determine how the problem will be uncovered. In some cases, you know, as a literature teacher, you might be noticing problems that occur within the literature itself, and you might use that as an opportunity for students to work on analysis through prediction. Um, as a elementary teacher, you might decide trying to have students uncover a problem as they are reading something or as they're learning about something might be very difficult. So you might wanna help present the problem to them. Again, there's many different ways that that problem can be uncovered. You wanna make sure that you are leading the students to that problem, but not necessarily giving them answers or teaching them about what they need to know before they get the problem. Fourth, you're gonna to wanna to predict to some degree what might happen. So as you start thinking about the problem, start thinking about obstacles or hurdles your students might run into, areas where they may need additional support. For my example, as I think about um, the problem that I might present, I'm gonna be thinking about what kind of resources I can curate for those students that when they are looking for some additional information or they're looking for that next source to help them uh, solve their problem, that I'm going to be able to help provide that for them or lead them in the right direction toward it without actually providing all of the information and the solution to the problem. <clears throat> and of course, we want to make sure we prepare the expectations for the students. How do we want this result to be communicated? What does that look like on the end as an end goal? And how will we know when we've solved the problem? Also, what is my timeline? Just like any good em uh, employer, we want to make sure our students are meeting deadlines. We want to give them a timeline for the work that they're doing. 
Now, once you've made it through the preparation phase, it's time to jump into phase one. Present or identify that problem. A couple of keys in this area are authenticity. It's really important that in some way, shape or form, the problem that you present to students feels authentic to them, that there are real world stakes in its application and in the solution to the problem. Don't just give a pseudo context of um, where the stakes or the situation couldn't really happen. Don't take away barriers that may exist simply because it'll make it easier for students. And make sure, also key here, is that the problem is presented before the core learning occurs. So before that you dive into teaching them what you really think you need them to know or what is part of that um, standard that you're trying to address. So for me in my Spanish example, I wanna let students know that we have a new English learner student who is a newcomer student that is entering our school next week. And in order to help him navigate and survive this school, we need to help him understand what school is like here uh, in our building and in our, um, and in our community. Now, leaving it at that, I need them to start thinking about all of the interpersonal um, communication they're gonna have to have with this student, the vocabulary that they're going to need. So there's a lot of pieces to that puzzle that I'm leaving out, but I really want them, and as a goal, want them to think about how they're gonna exchange this information with this brand new student who is a newcomer, meaning they're having very little um, English language ability um, but we want to make sure that they can they can survive as they enter the school. So now it's time to let our students develop a plan. This is going to create be a collaborative effort. This is where students might be partnering or working in groups. In this case, they should be asking questions and brainstorming ideas. One of the tools that I would want to use with my students um, in this case with my example is a KWI chart. And that is a no want to know ideas. So they might start listing some of the things that they already know that, that they have background in. This is where they can look back and say, you know, we've already learned vocabulary um, related to directions and, and objects and things around the school, how to describe people, etc. cetera. Um, but I wonder how we might uh, talk about things that have happened in the past. Uh, so we can give that student some context about things that, that they need to know. Um, and then some ideas are, we're gonna have to look up some new vocabulary and get some context around uh, specific topic areas. We're also gonna have to learn how to communicate uh, about the past to this student. So that's gonna be a great place for them to begin developing their plan. It gives them a nice structure to really determine what's needed and also help plan their work moving forward then they're gonna use that time to research. So this is where some of the skills that I maybe have taught them previously about uh, finding vocabulary and great tools and resources to use, or where I might've prepared some great vocabulary lists that I can share with the students that'll be related to this work. Uh, I might have some pre prepared videos around structures and communicating about the past for students so that they can use those, or I might lead them to some of them as if they need them, or I might just check in to see how they're researching and what they're coming up with to make sure it fits and works right. In this case, students also might be ideating. They might be kind of going back and forth about how they're gonna go about this. Are they gonna develop kind of a, a roadmap for the student? Are they gonna communicate it in writing? Are they gonna create a video? They might be, be coming up with some great ideas on how they're gonna communicate as well as they might be prototyping products. Um, depending on the type of problem that you encounter, you might be actually asking your students to develop something, in which case they're gonna have to be doing some testing materials to prototype. Not that that's a requirement, but it could certainly be uh, utilized. Phase three asks them to test or implement the plan. That means it's time to get it out there. It's, it's time to show off what they've come up with and really, um, solve that problem, basically. As they go through, they wanna make sure that they test the plan. So this is a great place to use some peer feedback where students are uh, presenting their plan or implementing their plan or showing their solution to other students to get some additional feedback, to see how other students maybe have approached the problem, 
as well as to see if they've missed anything. They should be considering the ramifications, new problems that are arising, unanticipated outcomes, or you know, maybe it's gonna create that question that I see in my classroom is, you know, when I looked up some vocabulary for that word, I came up with this term and I'm hearing you use that term. Is, or do they mean something different? Let's, let's clarify. It's a great place to seek feedback. So this is, as a teacher, is a great place to also think about how you might be using feedback loops to help students as they progress through this learning and making sure that they still achieve the understanding of content that you want them to achieve. Now at the end, phase four, we wanna evaluate the implementation and results. So this is that final presentation. This is that final submission of their work. This is that final outcome that they wanna to get to. As they get there, you also want them to reflect, give them some opportunity to talk to you about how the process went hurdles or barriers they encountered, questions that they still have, and, and really think about, you know, did they dive in as deeply as they expected to? What did they learn? What are some pieces that they still maybe have wonderings about? So using that four phase cycle, it's a quick and simple way to really help students work through and, and create a, a structure for what that problem-based learning unit or uh, event will look like. Now, as you think about this, what are some ways that are tools we might use to support problem-based learning? Well, the uh, first one I mentioned was for you as the facilitator, for you as the teacher to think about some questions that you might use, making sure that they are staying nice and open-ended, non-leading, but really help your students develop more inquiry skills. Questions like, well, where are you stuck right now? Or um, what's missing? what would be helpful to you right now so that they have to identify what they need. You're not just going to give it to them very easily. We want them to, to understand that they have to dive a little bit further and continue their learning process. I also mentioned during my example, the KWI chart. So here's an example of a KWI chart to help with problem solving. Again, it's the know, the what, and the ideas. So kind of goes a little bit different than the KWL chart that maybe you've heard of before, where they would fill in what they've learned as they go along. This is really a structure to help them uh, kind of plan for the problem that they're trying to uh, solve. You may also find that your students um, are not able to kind of dive into that critical thinking right away and, and jump into problem solving. So in order to help you with that, you might want to take a look at Harvard University's Project Zero. There are so many great thinking routine tools within this toolbox that you could really utilize some of them to help start building skills before you dive into a full-blown project-based learning event. Um, and that might be using something like the claims support question tool. So I dive into this. This is one where if you are having a, a, a problem-based learning event that requires a little bit of debate or um, opinion, students will have to learn about the claim support question technique where they make a claim, that explanation or interpretation, then they look for the support. Maybe it's things that they see, experience, or feel. Maybe it's things that they research and find. And then they start asking questions related to the claim. You know, what, what is still missing? What is in it solving? What is in it uh, fixing as we're moving forward? So a lot of good uh, pieces here to help scaffold those thinking routines within Project Zero from Harvard University. It's a great tool. I encourage you to jump in and learn a little bit more about it if you want to try problem-based learning. Another piece that's going to be really important is the role of that feedback. And so this is a piece that I remind you to keep in your toolkit and the type of feedback you're giving to students. In problem-based learning, as students are working, it's going to be really important that we use descriptive or effective descriptive feedback for students. You know, showing, telling students they've shown improvement or giving them motivational feedback is often very helpful. But in order to help them continue their learning, we really need to get to those descriptive or effective descriptive techniques. You see an example here. I know you set the goal to improve your work with estimation strategies and problem solving situations. How are you doing with that? So again, it's asking them a question, asking them to dive in and reflect a little bit. Or even from that dis descriptive, you know, in your essay, you have successfully covered the main points related to energy conservation. What could you add to the section on water conservation to deepen your reader's understanding? 
So it's really asking them to take the next step in learning and not just giving it to them or not just stopping the learning at a grade or a, um, a, a piece of feedback that doesn't help promote to the next level. And finally, you're probably gonna to wanna to think about assessment. How am I gonna grade this? How am I gonna account for it? So I ask you to consider the following when you think about the assessment. First, what are you assessing? Uh, often when we get into these events or these situations where we're doing uh, something outside the normal quiz, test, or assignment, um, the core component of grade isn't about that content standard or the skills that we're trying to get at. It becomes around all the stuff that happened as a around that content. So I first ask you to consider and focus on what are you assessing? What are the content standards? What are the skills that you are expecting? And how is that the largest component of the assessment? So for me in that Spanish example, I really wanna hear increased vocabulary skills around school related topics, topics related to youth and teenagers of that age, to their sequencing of information and the use of verb tenses to describe what happens in school. So that's something I'm really gonna be listening for and something that's gonna be the major component. And I'm gonna be watching to observe that. Now I might receive some different types of feedback on this. Interpersonal communication can be written, it can be spoken. So I might have to really watch and observe how that's going to come to me and be accepting of some different ways that that's gonna come, but I'm gonna be observing those competencies. Um, there's also some, some consideration for making this a success versus failure event. You know, were you successful? Did you solve the problem? You know, versus did you fail? And what does that mean for the assessment? In all cases, problem-based learning is a great place for students to do some self-assessment about what they learned, about new skills that they have, and let you, let you know how they've grown as a result of the process. And of course, we still want to consider that process and development. Those employability skills are not something that we want to take lightly. So we want to make sure we're considering those in the assessment. So this is a great place for using a rubric, but making sure that that rubric has heavier weight toward your content and competencies versus that uh, process and development. So hopefully those phases and what you've heard today is helping you think more about how you might implement problem-based learning in your classroom. Now, if you need some help with examples, I don't want to show you just a couple of videos, and I know I use the high school level example, so I encourage you to use the link for this uh, slide presentation, which you'll find in the comments, or not in the comments, in the description of the video below, so that you can check out the example that's most relevant to you. I threw some middle school examples in, elementary examples, and high school examples, so that hopefully it inspires you to see how this works in multiple contexts uh, across grade levels. You may also want to dive in and learn a little bit more about problem-based learning. Uh, so here's some great resources that I encourage you to take a look at just to dive a little bit more deeply in and understand a little bit more about that problem-based learning process. These are all great ways that we can engage in active learning with our students and really get those students to be the key drivers of the learning and, and helping to motivate them to continue that learning process well beyond just the, the lesson, the lecture, uh, or the task that was happening in the classroom. Thank you all for listening today, and I hope you continue to follow our um, online learning sessions here at Carbon Lehigh Intermediate Unit. Don't forget to go ahead and click below and subscribe to our page so that you can get any of the updates that are coming, coming along. Uh, and once again, my name is Eric Leck. I'm the Director of Curriculum and Instruction and Educational Technologies here at the IU.